Okay. Uh, hello. Today we're here with uh, author and publisher Kaylee Jones. Uh, Kaylee Jones is a founding faculty member at Wilkes University, as well as a former director, I believe, at uh, Southampton, uh, which is part of the Stony Brook uh, system. Uh, she her latest book, The Anger Meridian, came out in 2015. She's the author of a memoir, uh, Lies My Mother Never Told Me. What a wonderful title. Um, that, and, and three previous novels. Um, and in 2015, Kaylee started an imprint, a new endeavor called Kaylee Jones Books, uh, which is in uh, an imprint of Akashic Books. And we've uh, talked to Johnny Temple and Ibrahim Ahmad from Akashic Books. So today we're going to have a chance to talk to Kaylee Jones about this endeavor. And let me just start out, Kaylee. Uh, by asking, what prompted you to uh, do such a thing um, in, in, uh, in the middle of a writing career? And in the middle also, I might add, uh, Kaylee's also the chairperson of the James Jones Fellowship Award, and she'll talk a little bit about that too. So Kaylee, why, why Kaylee Jones Books? Well, at the time, I think, the, I, I think I really started talking to Johnny about it in 2014, and it was really because I felt that some of the very best projects that my students had written and revised and revised and revised were not getting published. And they, they had agents, they had interests, they had bites, but nothing came of it. And I started thinking that maybe there was a space in publishing for uh, what, what used to be called the midlist, you know, literary novel. Midlist was like a death no, you know, to, oh, he's midlist would mean that you were never going to sell more than 5,000 copies, no matter what you did. And, and there were so many of these books that were wonderful, but that really were not finding homes because of the amount of time, work, energy, and uh, backing, you know, financial backing that, that an agent, for example, puts into a book before it even finds a publisher. And I've spoken to several agents about this and they said, well, yeah, you know, we have to really uh, feel like not only that we love the work, which is crucial, but also that we can sell the work. And if there's, you know, the question there that, that we can't place it, we're putting all this time and energy into something that in the end will, you know, we have to be very, very careful. My agent, and several other agents also told me that they've been receiving something like 500 query letters a week, you know, and they used to answer every single one. And the query letters were from, are from very respectable writers who've published in vet, short venues, who've, you know, maybe had one book before, but, you know, are now homeless, so to speak, or orphaned, as we used to say, you know, their publishers didn't want their second book or, you know, something happened, the publisher, the, the editor moved on to a different house. And all these, you know, all these really good writers with projects that all sound, you know, wonderful. And the problem then is, is it original? Is it perfect? Like, does it need a lot of work or is it, is it ready? And um, third, is it marketable? And these are, the, you know, finding, um, you know, hitting the, the um, trifecta with that, she said, you know, is difficult and they just don't even have the time, energy or um, manpower to read. Uh, or woman power to read through the the manuscripts and query letters that they do receive. So I thought to myself, well, I can I can cut out that middle process that takes sometimes up to two years, you know, and sometimes with no results, and publish uh, works that I know because I've read them are really really good and viable, and it's been amazingly successful considering that five years ago. Um, the press didn't exist. Uh, you know, I didn't have any real uh, knowledge of publishing from the commercial side or from the from the publisher and um, sales team side. I only really knew about what it was like from the writer's side. And this has certainly changed my view of that as well. You know, I have a lot more compassion now for publishers and agents and people that used to make me angry a lot of times um, and I, I really do understand it better. Johnny was amazing. Johnny and Ibrahim have been incredible. They've supported this, this endeavor from the word go. And uh, one of our books, the most recent one that we published by Laurel Bread, it came out um, about, you know, right at the beginning of this pandemic we're having, you know, in, in uh, January. Laurel, Laurel's book was, uh, was reviewed in the New York Times, in the Sunday Times. And that was enormous for us, huge. Um, 
Uh, maybe that talk about one particular project, uh, uh, Kaylee, because I know one of the things that you've done as a mentor and as a publisher is really push writers to take their work to the next level, to, to actually finish it. Maybe, you know, choose one project that was particularly challenging with you as an editor and, and talk about the challenges that you, you faced in that, uh, in bringing that initial manuscript all the way through the process. Publication. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the things Johnny said to me right in the beginning when I started, you know, he had a kind of list of of what they, you know, what to be aware be aware of at, or wary of. And he said, when you're um, a publisher and an editor, you know, you have to wear your publisher and editor hat. You can't be the mentor. But I didn't I didn't understand. I mean, I really didn't do it that way, and I still don't because I'm we only publish two books a year. So if I want to take all the time in the world with a book that I think really has potential, I'll go all the way from, you know, early mentorship all the way up through publication with no problem um, because I believe in something. Um, there was, the, the, well, we can use, you know, Laurel Brett's book as an example that just came out in January, um, The Schrodinger Girl. That book start. she was in my, she was um, in, in a class I taught um, a, a beginning the novel class um, in Manhattan for Stony Brook MFA program. And she had this fantastic idea of this, of this very strange book, which is not something that I normally, not the kind of thing that I normally read, you know, kind of like um, a pensionesque or, or powers or, you know, where a, a psychologist who teaches at, in a SUNY school and is, um, teaches behaviorism, this is in the sixties, like 66, um, meets a girl in a, in a um, bookstore and um, they both pick up the, the book about Schrodinger's cat, um, that idea in, in um, physics that uh, the cat in the box, if you put poison in the box and you don't, for that time before you open the box to look, the cat is both alive and dead. Based on that principle, the girl that he meets in this bookstore divides into five different women, girls, and each completely different from the other. And so somehow it's about physics and the idea of alternate universes and this being some kind of, um, uh, he's a fulcrum of some kind for the change in this girl, these universes crossing. But the problem with the book was that there, he was not really a character in the book. He wasn't that important. And the idea was really good, but it was very philosophical. Um, and I, you know, we said, I said, you know, what, what if he's the narrator of the book? And then you have this added dimension of unreliability. And so she did about six drafts of that book over the next couple of years, three years. And, you know, with no promise of anything, just kept, keep going. And I kept working with her and um, it, it, it really is fabulous. It, it became a real novel about this guy's journey rather than just a kind of interesting philosophical, what if, you know, a person divided like that into five different uh, iterations of the same of the same woman, same name, same girl, um, but just completely different lives. Could they could, do they in this universe, this man's universe, this psychologist, can they coexist? And what does that say about the world? Right. So it, it, it was really interesting, but it took a lot. And then she finally had a draft that was almost done. And I asked my husband, my late husband to read it because he really loves powers, pension, um, DeLillo, and he had really good uh, understanding of using strange sort of alternate reality, very intellectual thinking, um, you know, in, in the books that he, he liked to read. So he did a draft with her, which really then finally was the draft that we did publish. And I never thought about, you know, it, is this something that, that I would pick up in the bookstore as much as is this something that people would pick up in a bookstore? So it's not about my taste really, but about the quality of the book. And, and I, I actually really love the book, but it's a strange, um, for me, that kind of writing has never been my central interest. But the thing that, that I think um, is most important is that all the books we choose have some kind of social um, commentary on the injustices, either historical or present day of the world that we live in. And that was really the only premise of the you know, books that, that, are, that you know, are entertaining, uh, page turners really great, but are saying something about injustice in you know the world, and that's the only criteria that we set down really for for the you know for the theme of the of the imprint. 
Um, and so it's been five years now, Kaylee, and you've had a number of uh, very big successes. I mean, we talked about, you know, Bar Barb Taylor, of course, with, uh, with, with her two books, and Lori Lowenstein with, with her two books, um, and a lot of other writers. And I'm wondering at this stage, you know, as you kind of look back at, at, at this body of work that you have brought into the world, what, I, I know that for myself, a lot of times I'm surprised, like just like you mentioned, you know, you find yourself liking something that you didn't know that you would be, uh, that you would like. I mean, for instance, I read a writer named Thorpe Mickle and he sent us a book called Venison, uh, you know, a book of, uh, and I'm from Queens, you know, I mean, I it's <laughs> like the likelihood of my understanding or appreciating anything about hunting is very, very small. And yet I love this, this work. So I'm, I'm wondering as you look back, on the on on this kind of cooperation that you have with writers, uh, do you see any themes that surprise you about the work that you've uh, published? What 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 is a, I think a fail safe for me, and this is not logical. So I'm sorry if this seems weird, but you know when I'm reading something, and it doesn't have to be polished. I'm when I'm reading something. I suddenly get a feeling where the hairs on my arms and in the back of, of my neck start to stand up, like literally like a chill. And I think, whoa, and, some, and I chase that, you know, I'll chase that in a work. And if something has that feeling or creates that emotion in me, I read, as you do, an enormous amount. And a lot of what I read is not really that much fun to read because it needs a lot of work. And I'm a teacher and I'm trying to help the student as you, know, as you are, and we're trying to educate them help them develop their reading lists and so on. That'll happen sometimes when something is not polished and not, you know, the writer's not there yet, but has the potential to get there. And that's a bar that I set. And it's a little higher than where the writer is at that moment. And I'll say, read this, not because he knows more than you or she knows more than you, but because you can learn from this writer. See if you can't it, you know, learn from that and try that technique here and see if you can't do that. And if they do, which generally, if I get that feeling where the hairs stand up, generally they not only reach that level, but they surpass. And then I'll put another bar up and they will go above that bar too. And that's, but sometimes, and this has happened to me quite a few times and I've been teaching a very long time, that will happen and the student, the writer stops writing. Mm. And that's something that I don't quite understand yet or have a real, I don't have a, a and this, it's not often, it's pretty rare, but the idea that it's not that one, that 10%, I don't know what it, if it's an ambition, not talent, that's another 10% somewhere along the way, but the, that piece of just like a person who's in a, a boxing match or a kickboxing match who gets back up, no matter how, how hard you hit, that person that gets back up, that's something innate maybe, or, or in your DNA, I don't know, where people don't stop. And I think that's the only thing that stands in the way of somebody completing or really getting to that point is whether or not you quit. Right, right. Um, I'd like also to talk a little bit about the James Jones contest. Um, many of our students, as you know, are, have worked with the James Jones contest as, as a part of an internship or just as, uh, uh, as a project that's paid. And, readers, uh, paid readers, yeah. Paid readers. So maybe tell us a little bit about the, the James Jones first novel contest. Well, in the, again, that's a talk about brick and mortar grassroots kind of thing. In 1992, we, the James Jones Literary Society was founded and we all got together in his hometown of Robinson, Illinois. And uh, the, these, they were mostly scholars, you know, Midwestern, uh, mostly Midwestern scholars, Mike Lennon, uh, who had been at the University of Illinois for a long time at that point, and um, there were people from Vincennes University in Indiana. Anyway, these, these people were very interested in my father, and they, we all got together, and they said, well, would you, would you, form a, would you be part of a society uh, for your father, you know, uh, inter, you know, talking about research and his work and so on. And I said, yeah, but the only thing that I care about and that I think we absolutely, that I, I will join, I will be a part of this if we have a fellowship in his name where every year we give money, a thousand dollars, you know, $1,500 to an unpublished first novel, because that's what he would have wanted. That's what he would have cared about. He always mentored writers 
I don't know how he found them or how they found him. Sometimes they'd sh show up and knock on the door of our apartment in Paris and my mother would try to send them away, but they wouldn't be distracted. And then <laughs> she'd have to call my dad upstairs in his office on the third floor in the back building and say, you have to come down. This guy won't go away or this woman won't go away. And he'd come down and, and spend several hours talking to them about their goals and their work. And, and he would take the time to help writers. And I think that would have mattered most to him. So they said, yeah, sure. And then Don Sackwriter, who had been a very young man, 17 years old, in the colony that my dad formed after the war, mostly they took in strays, you know, <laughs> veterans with PTSD, uh, uh, people who really didn't have anywhere else to go, you know, and, and were trying to write. So he formed this, this um, colony with a uh, this woman that he was involved with. And, um, and so Don had been in that, in that colony and it had changed his life. It had shaped his, 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 his character. He did not become a writer. He became a uh, pilot um, for Eastern Airlines and he worked for Eastern for 40 years or something. And then now he was retired and he said, well, I'll put up the first $2,500. He's just right there sitting next to me at the dinner. And that way we have something to start with. And so I spoke up and I said, I'll do this society with you. I'll be a part of this, but this is what I would like. And Don Sackrider just put up the first 2,500. Then other people started putting up money and it was not huge sums of money, but you know, started putting in money. I called Kurt Vonnegut. This, I've never told you this story, but it's, huh. it's pretty funny. Kurt Vonnegut was always supportive and very generous and kind to me. And he was a friend of my dad's. And I very nervously steeled myself and called him up and said, you know, Kurt, I want to start this, um, this fe fellowship for my dad. Um, you know, what do you think is what I said. And he said, forget it. Nobody will ever <laughs> give you money. It never works. People are shitty. They won't want to help, you know, and, uh, but good luck with that. You know, he was working probably. I bothered him while he was working. So then I, a year later said to him, you know, would you speak at a conference for us? He said, absolutely. And he said, by the way, congratulations. I'm really impressed by what you did because I didn't think you could do it. And the reason that it worked was because he'd helped people, my father, and those same people showed up and gave money to this award because he had helped them personally. There was one man called Charlie Robb, who was a veteran who had terrible PTSD. He wanted to be a poet. Uh, he went to the colony. My dad took him in. He didn't have a cent. He didn't have anything. And, and my, my father, um, you know, and Loney helped this guy quite a bit. When he passed away, which was a few years after that, Don had mentioned to him, you know, we're, we're starting, we're doing this award, we, we really need some money. When he died, he left his money to the society. And that was what, that was the money that really made it possible for us to have an actual foundation, an actual grant that is now $10,000 a year. And it's a $30, I think right now it's a $30 administrative fee, but that's to pay submissible, to pay the readers. And we haven't had to touch the uh, capital on this in a while because the number of applicants covered the ten thousand dollar payment and you know the the paying of the readers which is really important so the way we shaped it Mike Lennon had I, I didn't know anything about how to do a contest I had no idea I really I, I know a good book when I see one but I've never organized a contest and Mike Lennon set up a, the contest the way that he had done with many other contests which was every manuscript comes in um, um, anonymously no name and um, there's a, a summary of the entire book, which is two, two or three pages, you know, kind of precy of the book. And then the first 50 pages, and that goes to two readers. And the readers get paid $4 per manuscript. And you can read tw a batch of 20 at a time or 40 at a time, whatever you think you can manage. Some of our readers have been reading for us now for since then, like almost 20 years or whatever it is. And um, they love it. That gives them a feeling of empowerment. They feel like they're involved in something bigger than themselves. Um, anyway, so each, each book, each manuscript gets two readers, a yes and a no vote, then has a third reader who determines whether it's out or in. And so there are three, um, three layers. The first one is the main, you know, two readers, and then the, the third reader for the manuscripts that had a yes and a no. And we've had manuscripts that had a yes and a no to start with that of one, which is really interesting. Then it goes to, um, a semi-finalist round for all the ones that have a yes. And those are usually between, I'd say between 20 and 30 um, that have two yeses out of, let's say maybe six to 700 manuscripts that, that are submitted. 
So sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, but generally around there. So those 30 then go to the first 50 pages, go to um, the judges, and there's three, you, generally three or four judges. We, we use three now. They get paid $1,000 to determine the winner, the runner-up, and then the uh, honorable mention. So there's three uh, awards now, the $10,000 and I think $1,500 and then uh, $500 or $1,000 for the third one. I'm not sure what it is right now. I have to go look. But they, they judge and they decide. And again, there's um, rarely any fighting, but sometimes, you know, that does happen. You know, um, one of the criteria is that you must never have published previously a published novel. Self-published is included in this. That That's not, you know, if you've published a novel, you've published a novel, self-published or not no short stories or link, linked stories, we used to say yes, but that was getting very complicated with the number of, of applicants that we, that we were getting that were really not novels. And my father really, this, this was about him and about American novel writing. So we sort of said no, you know, no previously published novelists or short stories, just novels. And, you know, the range has been extraordinary. And, I think that that reading for this, you get paid, which is a good thing, but it is such an amazing lesson on not taking your time with your first 50 pages of your book, because these people are reading 40, 50 manuscripts, and if you don't catch them in the first paragraph, you're out. And so many writers don't really, and many MFA graduates too, you know, they write beautifully. They've got fantastic prose and a good story, but they don't understand momentum. They don't understand narrative drive, the need to have something happen on page one that makes you turn the page. And that's become increasingly important in today's market where truly you have, you know, back in the days of Tolstoy or Dickens, nobody had, the, nobody had you know, video games and, Twitter and television and endless streaming, you know, shows and so on, they had nothing to do. So the books would come out monthly, you know, in installments and everybody would run out and buy the magazine and bring it home and everybody would read it aloud and they would share that by the fireside. And they would take their time. You can tell when Dickens was running out of money because there are like, you know, 5,000 extra words that aren't necessary, but beautiful, you know, because he, he was paid by the word. You know, Tolstoy also, War and Peace was published in a magazine first. But nowadays, you can't afford to take 20 pages to get to the point of, you know, what the story's about because agents are overwhelmed, editors are overwhelmed, contest readers are overwhelmed. And really what you want to do is make it so that they can't stop reading. Wow. Um, and so for the students who, who actually... Uh... Uh, take on this role. How how would they go about? Uh... They they write it. They they send an email. We have an email address at Wilts right now. It's Joyce Anzalone is the administrator of this contest. They would write uh, an email to Joyce. The deadline is M March first for the manuscript. So by March fifteenth or something or March thirtieth or beginning of April, right around now, the manuscripts are all in. They've been logged. We do it through submissible. So you get a passcode you get a submissible link and then you go in and you read your 20 manuscripts and basically you say yes or no and you can put a note if you'd like on it you know some people do like to do notes some people don't and then um that goes to the second reader and that person does the same thing and you get paid four dollars per manuscript the most difficult thing i would say for students mfa students um is that because they're students they over -empath empathize with the writers and feel terrible about saying no because, you know, I think this is good, but it's not there yet. Oh, maybe I should say yes to encourage that person. Problem with that is then you're making a lot of extra work and payments too, because we need then the third reader to determine. Whereas if it's a no, you can always later, which Lori Lowenstein actually did at one point, she read a manuscript that wasn't ready, but that she thought had absolutely so much potential. So she wrote an email to the this man who got an honorable mention um, many, you know, several years ago, uh, or, or I think he was either runner up or honorable mention, I don't remember, but Lori wrote him a, a private email and said, I was one of the judges. 
And I have to tell you that I think this book is fantastic. And I really, really urge you to keep going. And he was so, he was a bus driver, New York City bus driver. And he, you know, got emailed her back and said, you made my, my year. I'm so happy. I don't know anybody in this business. I'm just a bus driver, you know. So Lori mentored him through three more revisions of that book. And then she called me and said, listen, I have one for you for, for your publishing company. I really think you should see this book. I read it. I loved it. I had problems with a few little things. I called him up and I said, would you be willing to do this, this, and this? Not guaranteeing you will publish it, but I really, really like what you're doing. And I think you, you have a real book here. He took another you know, six months or so to make those adjustments. And we published it. It came out last year, Cornelius Sky fantastic reviews and the sweetest thing in the world the mta put posters up everywhere <laughs> bus driver writes novel and you know people would get on the bus and say to him are you the are you the one who wrote that you know so he he's had a fantastic time with it he was so delighted and the book is truly fantastic and it's about it based in part on his uncle who was a doorman a new york city doorman you know irish all the way down the line union the whole thing and it's about his his job as a doorman in New York City in the in the late seventies in the seventies or you know when when New York was really in bad shape you yeah. know uh, and it's about the sort of it, it reminds me a bit of City of Night you know John Re sure. Ricci's book it reminds me a bit of that beautifully written beautifully written and and that was because Lori wrote him an email so I think you know if you feel strongly that this book deserves you want to encourage the person you can write an email and say you know at the end we will let you know who the right who the writers are and give you their email addresses, not while you're reading it, but at the end, you, you get to know who they are. And then if there's something that really stuck out, the, the, the reader can write an email to that person and say, you know, I really, I really wanted this book to make it through and I you know, felt very strongly about it, but I think you need to do this, this, and this to make it, you know, to finish it, to polish it. And, and that, you know, just that one phone call, there was a guy who didn't win, but he was a, a runner up a few years ago, wrote a really good book about, uh, Leningrad, of course, St. Petersburg, uh, you know, in the day, right after the, you know, the fall of communism and the corruption and how great, and it was really wonderful. And I wrote him a note because I know Russia pretty well, or at least I did back then, told him how wonderful I thought it was. And he's been supporting, he, he, I, he put the book aside, but he's still writing. And he said that it really gave him the courage and hope to keep going, you know, for, for a long, long, long time. We're still in touch. He supports the society, you know. So, you know, there's something to say for the act of encouragement that this produces in writers. We've had a few problems over, over the years, like we've had uh, writers who um, published a novel before and either didn't tell the truth about it or said, well, it was a, it was a collection, collection of linked stories. It wasn't a novel, but that's still, if it says novel on the cover, that's a novel. You know, if you self published it because you couldn't wait, that's a publication. So they will try to slip it under the, you know, just under that, you know, not paying attention really to the um, rules or thinking, you know, well, I can slip this in. Nobody, nobody will know. And, and that causes endless trouble you can imagine for the judges, you know? We've had that situation three times now. Oh. So, uh, Kaylee, students should write to uh, joyce.anzalone at wilkes.edu to exactly. apply to become this. And, and in so when you're picking books, the, the deadline is in, in March. So when do you start ramping up looking for- Right around up? now. Right around now. And since everybody's home and can't leave the house, I have a feeling that, <laughs> that this year we'll, you know, we could use readers and this year I think we'll get them done pretty quickly. Usually the deadline is, uh, you know, you, you have 20, let's say it takes you, you know, two weeks. If you get them back right away, she's going to love you because then we don't have to remind her, you know, we don't have to send reminders. And if you're done and you liked it, you could get another batch of 20, you know. The point about that though, and, and it looks good on the resume, let me tell you, you know, I've, I have two former readers who got jobs teaching at universities because that was what stood out on their resume that made them different from everybody else that was applying for the job. But the thing that's interesting is that, um, you know, it depends how fat, the nervousness about doing it at first is always tricky. Like, gosh, this one's pretty good. You can make different piles, you know, and say, all right, well, this one's a maybe. If this one's a sure yes, 
you know, then this one's definitely a no and split, split it into piles and see how fast and easy it goes for you. If something is not there, you don't have to read the 50 pages, put it aside. You know, why would you take the time if something has 20 spelling errors on the first page? Why would you waste your precious time going through something that somebody else didn't even take the time to correct? You know, don't, you have to think about that stuff. Agents have to think about that stuff all the time. Writers do too, and they should, you know, and that's the writer's responsibility in a sense. And by, the, so I think there's a deadline. It has to go to the judges before, I mean, Labor Day is when we hope to have to announce you know, the, the winner right around then. This last year we got done early. Um, Joyce line, you know, gets together all the ones that need a third reader. So in other words, ones that got a yes and a no. And then she gives those batches out to people um, to be the third reader. And then it goes to the, to the judges. So, and the judges need, you know, a month about. So by August, hopefully we're, you know, we have our, our finalists you know, to, or semi-finalists to go out and then we na narrow it down to the finalists. It's really important to um, be a good reader. Like if you're not a reader and you don't read literary fiction, I don't recommend doing this because you won't know, you won't recognize, you know, what it takes or what it, what we really need here in terms of, so that's why we sort of limited it to graduate students or students who've graduated from MFA programs who are writers or are really involved in reading, you know, as professionally as you, as you possibly can. So I have a few readers. I have one reader who um, was a theater major and she's not got an MFA, never had an MFA. She's not a writer, but I've known her for 30 years. And every time we see each other, she talks about what she's been reading and she's at, an, analyzes those books in a way that I see that she's a serious reader, even if she's not a writer herself. And I asked her one year, you know, listen, if you have extra time, we need extra readers, would you read? That was about eight years ago. She's now read every year for eight years and she's picked three winners. <laughs> and that's really funny because she's not, but she's a very serious literary reader. Right. And she's an omnivor omnivorous reader. She reads all kinds of different styles and types of books. And, and that's what we want is somebody who can recognize what a good sentence is. And I think sometimes um, undergraduates or students who are like, let's say, uh, screenwriters may not have the knowledge necessary to be able to judge the first 50 pages of a novel in progress. But I also rely on the other teachers I know and mentors I know to recommend their students because if you said Phil I have a poet but he's so great or she's so great they she's a great reader I think she'd be good for this I would I wouldn't even question that you know I'd be absolutely that's that's great because that's what we want is enthusiastic readers who love books right Right, and what a wonderful way to get introduced into the literary world from this other point of view. Both you and I have had the experience of first, you know, being writers and then getting into publishing. And, and I think, uh, you know, you can speak to the fact that it really does, as you mentioned earlier, changes your perspective and gives you, uh, gives you a little more empathy for people that you once didn't understand or were just annoyed and irritated with. I mean, one of the, I, I had a student um, from my, uh, the program where I teach at Stony Brook, who was really, she was a really good writer, but she would not get to the point. You know, it would be very, you know, 50 pages or whatever. And she was not getting to the beginning of the story, really. And so I said, listen, why don't you read for us? She's a graduate student. You could read for me. It would really help. So I get a call about three weeks later and she says, oh, wow. <laughs> Now I understand what you're talking about. So many of these books are really well written, but nothing happens in 50 pages. And I am so tired of reading 50 pages, waiting for something to happen. I'm never going to do that again as a writer. I'm never going to do it again. So in a way, it's a good teaching tool, you know? Right, right, right. Well, thank you so much, Kaylee, for joining us today. I keep saying us. I'm the only one here. No, it's um, everybody. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but eventually, yeah, we're gonna, we're, we're hopefully, we're gonna share this with, uh, with a lot of people, and uh, we really appreciate all the work you do. And um, you too. And you uh, do. Yeah. I really appreciate your support and the people you've sent my way. And I've watched how you run, you know, Etruscan, and it's really helped me to find my footing. So I'm, I'm grateful to you. 
Well, thank you so much, Kaylee. And uh, we will hopefully, we won't be seeing you in June at the residency, but we'll be seeing you hopefully in some online format. And then I hope, I hope to see you again in person on the other, on the other side. On the other side. Bye, okay. Phil. Bye, Kaylee.